Is your job search stuck? Maybe you're not getting any interviews with employers, or maybe you are, but no job offers. Or you may be new and not even know where to start. This is Charles Maxwood, and I'm releasing a new course and ebook on how to find a job as a software developer. The course walks you through the process of finding the types of companies you want to work for, getting their attention, and putting your best foot forward as the candidate they want. I've coached dozens of developers in looking for jobs and have been able to help several people find jobs within two weeks to two months. So whether you're new to development, can't find a great job that fits what you want, or are looking for remote work from an area without a strong tech community, I can help. Go to getacoderjob.com and sign up today. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another My JavaScript Story. This week, we're talking to Chris McKnight. We're probably also going to put this on My Angular Story. Uh, Chris, do you want to say hi? Hello. Uh, Do you want to just introduce yourself real quick, let people know who you are and what you do? Sure. I'm I'm Chris McKnight. I'm a software engineer based out of Franklin, Tennessee, just outside of Nashville, Tennessee. I work for a a, uh, medium-sized consulting company called IOLAP, IOLAP IOLAP.com. And I have been working on various technologies, including JavaScript, Angular, uh, NativeScript, and Node.js as well. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, well, this, this podcast is focused around telling your story and letting people know how you got into programming and things like that. Uh, just give everybody an opportunity to take away whatever it is that they will from, from what you've been through. To get us started, I kind of wanted to just dive in and talk about how you got into programming. Yeah, sure. So I was a really big nerd in high school. <laughs> Grew up in a small town in Louisiana. We didn't have a computer science program, so I kind of read books, <laughs> picked it up mm-hmm. myself, started writing uh, some C++ and PHP. And I mean, I had maybe one person in the school that knew what I was talking about. You know, kind of bounce ideas off of him and... uh Tried to pick up Perl, and the Perl book was really daunting. So that's when I kind of switched towards PHP because I wanted to do more web development instead gotcha. of using C++ and writing these little console programs. And really, uh, really takes me back. I was using C++ with Visual Studio 2003, <laughs> and uh, it's just right after Visual Visual Studio or Visual Visual C6 uh, actually came out. Mm-hmm. So I was really back in the day, and um, Microsoft Foundation classes were a thing. So you could write Windows applications in C++ and call into the native, the native Windows uh, functions. But yeah, moved into PHP and uh, then started working for a small consulting company in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. After I gradu- after I graduated from LSU, and so do you have a CS degree then, or? I do. I do. I have a computer science degree with a secondary discipline in mathematics. So it's a minor plus six hours or nine hours, something like that. Mm-hmm. Not a not a whole lot of not a whole lot of math, but I guess more than more than the normal. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So I graduated from LSU. Picked up. Actually, got a job offer before I even graduated. Doing some. Um, Got some part time kind of building out applications for that company uh, because they were just swamped with the they had two developers at the time that were full time and they needed to bring on some some more help. So I was writing PHP with uh, Symphony the Symphony framework one dot one dot two one dot three one dot four. We had a couple of different applications built in each one. Then they said, "Hey, we we use jQuery a lot. So here's this application rewrite as much of this." Backend rendering code and PHP into jQuery and give them a nice uh, user user experience and user interface to mm-hmm. to uh, actually use the the clients I'm talking about. So I started, of course, fumbling around with jQuery and not really learning JavaScript. And I guess I really didn't learn JavaScript until two years after that point. <laughs> Makes sense. Can I can I back you up really quick? Sure. When you got started, you mentioned that you were doing C and C plus plus and things like that. What? Why those languages yep. in particular instead of, I guess, uh, more uh, modern or approachable languages? I mean, even Java, for example. Yeah. So I, I guess I approached them because it was more of this is what we're this is what a lot of tutorials on the internet were written in, and mm-hmm. Java was. 
Java was really a new kid on the block. I did a little bit of Java, but right. it, was, it was a couple of programs here and there. I think I, think I still have them around. Um, <laughs> like a, a poker application. Oh, there you go. Um, so, and there's another one that's like slot machine application. And there's some other random ones that are draw this little smiley face in Java. And it's using using a really, really good graphics and abstraction library called uh, ACM. I don't know if it has anything to do with the Association of Computing Machinery, but yeah, I don't know what it was named. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't know. I just rolled with it and kind of dug into the jar file a little bit of it and yeah. uh, built out those couple of apps in Java. But yeah, I kind of wanted to get into more of a, a language, as you said, that's more a little bit more user friendly. Which PHP, looking back, <laughs> it, it has it has some of the same problems as JavaScript, of course, but it's not a not a terrible starter language for getting up and running. No, I mean I took Java and C and C plus plus classes in college. When I really got into wanting to build my own stuff, you know, I wound up in PHP as well, and then eventually I wound up doing Ruby on Rails. But that's another story. And it was yeah, it was easy, it was approachable. So yeah, I, I totally understand why you'd go that way. Yep, I picked up Rails uh, years years later. I guess after being at that small company for two and a half years I picked up rails and mm-hmm. did some Ruby, but it's kind of kind of fallen out of that um picked up a lot more a lot more on the javascript side i had a really right. really good mentor at uh that company like i said about two years after i started at the company really got proficient in javascript itself so i didn't know what I mean, I kind of knew what reduce and map and filter were, but I didn't really know how to use them idiomatically in, in JavaScript right. itself. So I would usually reach for a jQuery, give me give me your each or give yep. me your, your like, I, I don't even know what they have. I think they have reduce or map or something. It's been so long since I've used jQuery, honestly. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. And that's kind of the way I came through it. Well, when was it that you started taking JavaScript seriously, Ben? It was... Towards the end, uh, beginning of 2013, end of 2012. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's been a little while. What What was it that kind of pushed you that way? Uh, just frustrations of just frustrations of not not using JavaScript as well as I could, and running into all these all these issues that could be fixed with just knowing JavaScript itself um, instead of going around jQuery. It's, in jQuery, you have to call. A lot of the times it'll do this implicit kind of, we kind of know what you're trying to do with looping over it and kind of pull out what you need, but sometimes it doesn't do that. Mm-hmm. And so then you run into all these bugs of, oh, you can't, you can't call, you can't call this on undefined or just right. things like that. And basically you get, you get back the jQuery object, but it's actually empty. Like it's, it's just mm-hmm. an empty selector. So there's nothing actually in it, but you have a jQuery wrapper object. Right. So when I really started taking JavaScript seriously of, okay, how does this work? And why am I running into this problem? And of course, of course, a lot of, a lot of the issues too are fixed with the, the entire use strict and basically type of variable triple equals undefined, the string undefined, the so kind of type checking it in that way, which is kind of, it's kind of been uh, something you don't have to really do with JavaScript lately. Just little tricks here and there with JavaScript, which I learned over the years as well. So Yeah, that makes sense. So it sounds like it was more out of necessity and avoiding certain pain points with that came up just from not knowing the language. Yep, exactly. And even more of those pain points have been have been reduced with I've been using TypeScript for the past two years. TypeScript and Angular started in Angular 2.0.0, and now it's up to version 6 and version 7 should be here shortly. Mm-hmm. And a lot of those, hey, you tried to call you tried to call a number method on a string or vice versa. So you catch that at actual like app development time really, right. really fast. Yeah, because you have the TypeScript... It has anyway. It has a, a process running that it checks against. So, yep, exactly. And so it catches a lot of those, a lot of those easy, 
yeah. mistakes like that, like those easy bugs where it's, hey, we had this ticket come in and it's like, okay, well, it's a five to 10 minute fix and mm-hmm. then 15 to 30 minutes to deploy it to production. So it takes a lot of that away. It's still not, still not bulletproof, I, I would say, because some to- sometimes you can say, you just say, hey, I want to ignore it and say it's any type. Right. <laughs> or, or, it doesn't give you runtime guarantees. So something, something external could come back and it's in, it's in a weird state that you weren't expecting from an API, for example. And you'll have to take that into account, but mm-hmm. there's some other, some other libraries out there that have kind of been on the forefront of fixing that kind of problem. GraphQL is one of them, which I've just started using recently. And uh, it's also another one called REST typed which it's kind of the idea is to it's similar to graphql Mm -hmm. except a lot less tooling around it but if you have you have your typescript types and uh it you basically map them to what your rest api will return and oh interesting yeah interesting wrapper around (laughs) around making rest calls yep so when I talk to people, especially about JavaScript, a lot of times I, I get basically the narrative of, well, I started doing more stuff in Node or uh, React or something. And, you know, I just, I really fell in love with the language. And it was interesting because your reasons for, you know, learning JavaScript more deeply was mostly because I hated running into these problems. So did you ever get to the point where you actually loved working in JavaScript? I did. It it took a while. A lot of a lot of the other pain points involved involved re- reduce, for example. So I have to write all this code just to do a simple addition, for example, and mm-hmm. reduce came learned about reduce and it just like it was it was changing. Like it it made me love JavaScript because I could write basically the short amount of code and sum up a value where it's a lot shorter than saying I have a variable, I do a for loop or I do a for each loop, run everything through. And then at the end, I'm, I get a result. And that's, it's kind of more, it's, it's a lot less uh, imperative using, using reduce. Cause if you use reduce, you could actually swap out your, your callback function, right. And have kind of your functions segmented out and say, Hey, reduce call this, call this function that, will add the ages of the people mm-hmm. if you have like people objects and it'll do it. <laughs> Another, like one of the other things that still bothers me though, is filter. It's always, uh, what does it return? I have to stop and think, am I supposed to return true or false? Which, which one does it, which way does it work? Does it work like Ruby select or reject? <laughs> and so right. It's always a stumbling block. And uh, a lot of that is kind of, gone away for some some things uh there's actually there's actually uh find and find index which a lot of the time is really what you're looking for like a lot of the times you see the pattern of filter run this expression and give me index zero to get the first thing where you can use these newer find and uh find index es6 methods so Mm -hmm. it's just ES 2015 is probably when I really started loving JavaScript, I would say. Right. So what have you done with JavaScript that you're really proud of? So at my my previous job, I started a new job last month. Mm -hmm. Um, So I used to work for a mortgage company here in Franklin. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was really proud of the Angular application. Well, Angular applications, I should say. We had a user facing one and we had a loan officer facing one. And that uh, loan officer facing one is really, it's really complicated. And we, it, all of the logic was abstracted away. I mean, if you guys back up, it started out with a minimum viable product of here it is, it, it works kind of, there's some bugs. And then we ripped it to shreds, <laughs> um, coworker and I. and put everything into logical like feature modules and that's really really where 
what I'm proud of is that application. And at least I know I left and it was in a good, a pretty good state. And I think it's probably going to be shipped pretty soon as well. But that's, uh, that's what's I, that's a whole other conversation, uh, outside of this talk. But it was using Angular, latest and greatest. We had some libraries which extra abstracted everything from authentication to our, our, what our components would look like in the application. And we plugged them into two separate applications. We had, like I said, we had the user facing and the loan officer facing one, and we had a shared library that they would both pull uh, components out of. Mm -hmm. And we used uh, NGRX, which I don't know how familiar you are with that, but it's kind of like a, it's an in memory store in your browser, kind of like a database. I don't like calling it a database, but that's where a lot of our, that's where a lot of our, a lot of our logic would uh, fit into Angular services and NGRX would only be our data or some other calculations that we had that mm -hmm. we didn't, we wanted the calculations in our components and we didn't want to run the calculations every time because of how Angular change right. detection works. So NGRX has a built-in uh, caching mechanism or minimization. So whenever any of that data changes, then it'll recompute it using the uh, what's called a selector. Like we had some, we had some composed and some kind of a, they're like advanced selectors basically. Right. So, yeah. So speaking of Angular, how did you get into Angular? <laughs> That's another interesting story. So October 2016, I, I can still remember because the that's when 2.0 dropped around October 2016. Mm -hmm. I was I was all against Angular. <laughs> <laughs> uh, manager came to me and said, "Okay, we we need to build applications. We need to build them. We need, we need to build really good front end UI, unit testing." The whole right. the whole nine yards. <laughs> it has to be quote unquote enterprise. So he came to me and said, All right, you do some research on React since I was I was big into React at the time. I had written a couple of I mean tutorial applications and I had started migrating an application to to React. So I looked into React for a couple of days and I I just wasn't impressed with the tooling at the time. It was it was kind of difficult to get set up. I didn't I didn't feel like I was getting anywhere very fast, especially with the forms aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And so then I said, "All right, well, I think I think I've found enough with React. <laughs> right. I think I've kind of explored it enough." So then I explored Angular, and I just learned and I learned about Angular as 2.0 at the time and just did a deep dive on uh, egghead.io going through the through the basics of Angular course and learned learned a lot in I mean maybe two days and got got actually pretty decent decent at Angular. And then um, once I saw how fast I could build stuff, especially on the form side, I kind of just was pulled into angular and just kind of moved on down the line i guess i guess six months later i was writing angular applications with ngrx and abstracted logic just uh, services and angular just they made they made sense to me mm -hmm. like putting your code and your services and abstracting that logic out into services especially if it's going to be interacting with third-party like API or any sort of right. API. So that's that's really where I was drawn into Angular's that enterprise feel of and there's this there's a start at the time there's a starter kit and a couple months later we switched over to the Angular CLI and that was a night and day difference. <laughs> oh yeah. The CLI made a huge difference. So NG new and you have you have an application that has yep your style set up in SAS or you can keep them in CSS if you want to, or I think it even supports less. And that's, that's where I was really drawn into it as well as just NGCOI, so NG new, and then NGC, NG, NGG service, all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. Just generate all these, 
all these things. And there's actually a um, Visual Studio Code extension I've been using for a little while. So I don't even have to leave Visual Studio Code and go to the command line. It'll I right click on a folder and say schematics create create this component here. Yep. And it drops it drops its own its own uh, command into the into the terminal of Visual Studio Code and creates whatever I told it to create with whatever name I told it. So it's it's really really fast for wrap it up development yeah. now. Yeah, I definitely am a big fan of the CLI, and that's something that we had for a long time in Rails. And uh, yeah, so just kind of seeing the the capability come over to Angular and be like. You know, I have this template for a thing, you know, make it. It's just really, really nice. Yep. So what are you working on these days? So these days, since I started a new job last month, been less mm-hmm. on less on Angular. I do some Angular uh, in my spare time. I work for a startup uh, here, in, here in Nashville. So I'm working on that at night. So it's single music. We do some, we do music delivery. So that's mm-hmm. that's my night night kind of masquerading. It's still Angular. During the day, though, I work at IO Lab and I build. Funny enough, <laughs> I actually actually build uh, some UIs in React. I did that for a couple of weeks. I, I learned I learned a lot. I learned I, I could see where React was actually was actually liked by the community. I mean, right. JavaScript code, you write JavaScript code, and I mean, that's that's it. You don't. There's not a whole lot special to it. There's no special real syntax other than JSX. So I did that for a couple of weeks. There's also a Node.js backend portion to that same application. I dug into that a little bit. Got a little bit modernized and some cleanup and refactoring sort of things. Now I've actually moved into building a prototype for a potential new client in Angular NativeScript. <laughs> So oh, back, nice. Back to Angular. Yep. Uh, so I've been doing that for the past three weeks now. This mm-hmm. is the third week. And I've been enjoying native script. I just drop uh, drop a label or a button in the HTML file of the component, and I have a native label or button. I can pass it mm-hmm. sort of attributes or properties, just, just like I would in a native, uh, I mean, a, a web application for Angular. Right. And it all works kind of the same, <laughs> but it's it's a it's a little bit of a black box for me, but it's it's really nice. Very nice. I don't know if I have any other questions. Is there any part of your experience that you think people could learn something from that you want to call out? Yeah, I would say um, if you can learn the learn what's happening under the hood of uh-huh. libraries such as jQuery. Learn the learn the fundamentals of JavaScript first. It's a lot of excellent resources which have been mentioned uh, on many JavaScript podcasts, especially especially this one and, and uh, JavaScript Jabber as well. So you have Exploring JS, you have ES ES twenty fifteen resources on GitHub. There's you don't know JS. Mm-hmm. Any Pretty much any of any of the large confer- JS conferences have have talks on JavaScript. They can at least take away some knowledge from them. And uh, I mean, just keep learning and keep at it. I, I, the biggest thing, of course, is type coercion. So kind of figure out when you should use double equal versus triple equal. Most of the time, most of the time, it's triple equal. And now, tool the tools are so are so good. Um, so I use Prettier and I use TS Lint, and they will they will tell me, hey, you probably don't want to do this. Yep. And my TS Lint rules are set up to. I use the TS Lint recommended, and I use the uh, TS Lint config Prettier. And so that's the TS Lint config Prettier is it pulls my Prettier settings and applies them to TS Lint. Mm-hmm. I don't have to. I don't have to write the same rules twice. I don't have to say, okay, prettier, I'm using a tab width of this and TS length, I'm using a tab width of this and I'm using a quote mark right. on this. So in my applications, I use I use the, the single quotes uh, mm-hmm. all the time, except for whenever I want to do just interpolations, so then I use the newer right. 2015. 
So that's that's where I would say is learn the fundamentals and use the tooling and especially learn about polyfills. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because browsers are they vary vastly across. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah. polyfills have saved me a lot of time just by setting them up, setting them up in the first place, or use Babel to transpile if you know you're going to be running on Internet Explorer or any sort of other browsers that you just have to support for legacy reasons. But uh, yeah, I think that's that's my takeaways. Awesome. Yeah, and and a lot of that is is really solid. One thing that I find is that a lot of developers just to you know back you up on some of the points you made a lot of developers are using chrome because the dev tools are just awesome and then like i watch my mom use the computer and it's she uses what she calls foxfire which is a, a really nice browser made by mozilla that she just can't get the name straight on or you know I, I see other people and they just use whatever the default is on their phone or computer so you know microsoft edge or safari or you know um, whatever and so yeah you know the polyfills and the JavaScript fundamentals, most of that stuff works across the board. And yeah, the polyfills will fill in the gaps. And then, yeah, from there, then it's a matter of, okay, what do I want to stack on top of this now that I have a solid foundation to work from? Yes, I guess after the fundamentals, I would I would look into, I mean, there's DOM, learning the DOM stuff. You could spend, <laughs> I mean, years on the on learning the DOM APIs and they're constantly changing. And I think that's another that's another that goes back to the point of learn what the frameworks and libraries are doing, mm-hmm. uh, but also don't don't use the framework or library and write raw DOM manipulations inside of inside of React or Angular. Right. I've seen that, and it's it's more of fighting the framework instead of utilizing it. But I, I would say at least know that as a fundamental as well. It's, learn the dom or at least what platform you're running in and other than that it's it's kind of uh you can pick up some computer science fundamentals it hasn't been i haven't used computer science fundamentals a whole lot but it does help in certain situations right and it's uh, all this stuff is free on the internet basically (laughs) through coursera or edx all sorts of free online courses and there's free code camp as well. It's, it's a vast, it's a vast ecosystem, vast community. Mm-hmm. But I'd say also don't get overwhelmed. <laughs> I've gotten overwhelmed myself. That's yep. kind of my advice on that. It's good advice. All right. Well, if people want to find you online or, you know, follow what you're working on and things like that, where do they go? Yeah, best places are GitHub and Twitter. I have been working on a personal website slash portfolio. I haven't published anything yet, but Twitter and GitHub are the best uh, pl- best places. I have the same username. It's C-M-C-K-N-I-3, mm-hmm. which comes from my LSU pause ID <laughs> from back in the day. So yeah, that's, I have a lot of a lot of projects on GitHub. I'm always opening issues and sending pull requests, merging pull requests. I have a couple of Angular libraries that I maintain. And there's a couple of, uh, there's Cool Gun by Infinite Red as well that I'm a contributor on. So that's the best places to find me. All right. Well, let's go ahead and do some picks. Do you have some things you want to shout out about on the show? Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat 
and enter dev chat in the how did you hear about us section. I do. So um, I mentioned earlier that I'm using an extension in VS Code to generate Angular components and services and modules, all, all the sort of things. It's called Angular Explorer. And it you install it. If you're in a if you're in an Angular project, it detects your Angular JSON file or your dot Angular minus CLI.json file. And you can right click on it any any folder in your project and say schematics it'll prompt you prompt you at the top like it does for the, like like the command palette command palette style you type in what or it gives you a list of the schematics you want to run it on which a schematic is a collection of generators so kind of like ruby rake files you can write your own kind of generators or rails right. generators select the schematic It'll prompt you in the next prompt to say, what do you want to generate? You pick components, service. And finally, it'll prompt you and say, what do you want to name it? And you name it just like you would on, on the command line. That's basically NGG component and then the name. You can't, you can't do any options yet, but that may, that may come in the future. I'm not, not totally sure, but yeah, that's my pick. It's really really great for rapid application development. And I would also say I picked VS Code. I've been using it for a year and a half now. And it's, it works great. There's extensions for native script, Angular Explorer, and Git, Docker, <laughs> Azure, you name it. And that's, that's my second pick. And I have one more pick, which is less on the tech side, but it's, I guess, I guess it is. It's tech, but it's also personal finance. Mm -hmm. I've been big in personal finance for a few years now. I've just staying staying out of debt or not going into a lot of debt when possible. And it's the uh, Swish app. And what it is is it's it's actually built in Native Script, which is interesting. It's personal finance app to track your spending, kind of like Mint.com. Mm -hmm. It walks you through, create an account, you link your bank accounts, which I think they use the same sort of API as Mint.com. So you link all your accounts that you that you want. Then it asks you, okay, let's set up your monthly budget and your monthly savings. And you say, okay, it actually lets you pick from a list or you can enter a number manually for your for like your income each month. And you go to the next step. It asks you, okay, what are your what are your monthly recurring bills? And they actually figure that figure that out for you as well, for the most part. But you also can pick from the list. So that gives you kind of your income and your expenses. And then the next step is pick your savings. You can do five, ten, twenty percent, or you can put in a custom number. And in the app, it'll actually show you a um, a like circle of how much how much you've spent in the month. And it will tell you how much you have left to spend each day to meet your savings goal. It's really, it's really been nice. Awesome. It sounds terrific. I'll have to check it out. Cool. I'm going to do some picks as well. So one pick that I have is Discord. It's, how do I put it? It's kind of a mix between what, Slack and Skype. And I, I've really been liking it. Um, I got involved in a gaming community because I, I have a couple of games that I play on my phone when I'm you know, have some downtime. And uh, yeah, one of them, the the group that, so I was playing, what is it, Dominations? And so, you know, you build the civilization. It's kind of like Clash of Clans if you played that, you know, so you're upgrading your technologies and things like that. And anyway, the, I, I guess it's a clan or a, an alliance. Anyway, the alliance had a Discord channel. And so I wound up installing it. I really like it, really, really like it. So I'm going to pick Discord. And I'll probably, I should just shout out about Dominations as well because it's been fun. So uh, yeah, I'll pick those. Yeah, and I think that's about it. So uh, anyway, thanks, Chris, for coming and talking to us. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's, a, it's an honor to be on the show. Oh, no no problem. Thanks for coming. It's, it's nice just to, again, hear how different people come to this because I, I don't think there's a right way. And I think sometimes people get the idea that there is. And so it's, oh, okay, you know, this person has a CS degree. This person came to it after being a musician for years. And, 
you know, and so it's, it's terrific just to kind of see where everybody's at and, and what's going on in the community today. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I took a little bit of more of the traditional approach, but <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. Just, just yeah. like there's nothing wrong with coming in uh, any other way. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap this up. I have another one of these calls coming up soon and uh, we're pretty much done anyway. So uh, thanks for coming. All right. Thanks. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.